I've searched through Twitter, Facebook, mainstream news, the depths of all of that toxic stuff, and I've condensed what I found into a list of the most common pro-abortion arguments. There's like 20 or 30 something that I found. There was a lot of repetition from the low IQ individuals that were complaining about this whole thing in the first place, but nonetheless, we are going to refute every single one, so stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, pals and gals. Welcome to Heck Off Kami. I'm even going to include for you the timestamps of each argument in the description if you want to skip to a certain one. So, first up at bat, the constitutional right argument. We hear this from Bernie Sanders. We hear this from Elizabeth Warren. The idea that we have a constitutional right to abortion. That's not true on any level. On the surface, it's false, of course, because the Constitution does not say that anywhere. You dig a bit deeper, it's still false. And here's basically what happens. So you've got Griswold versus Connecticut in 1965. The Supreme Court established that the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments imply a right to privacy, and so they established that as judicial precedent. This was then used in Roe v. Wade because from there they used the right to privacy to encompass a woman's private decision whether or not to murder her child. So. Now you've got people that uh, people that are saying that women have the right to an abortion in a constitutional right even, and of course such is not the case. You absolute fools. So um, now you flash back a little bit, enter stage 1791, James Madison, a Federalist. And for those of you who don't know that Federalism, or what Federalism is, Federalists believe in a separation of power between the states and the federal government, kind of like what we have now, except the federal government really likes to overstep its power. Like here, for instance, because James Madison wrote the Ninth and Tenth Amendments to be pro-federalism amendments. The Ninth Amendment states that the government can't infringe upon rights just because they aren't specifically outlined in the Constitution. And then the Tenth Amendment states that any power not delegated specifically to the federal government is given to the states. So what they've done is say the Ninth Amendment actually guarantees a right to privacy. Therefore, the Tenth Amendment doesn't apply here and abortion access must be allowed at the federal level. Uh, that argument is irrelevant. It is irrelevant. Here's why. So, during Roe, they argued that it is a private decision to be made between a woman and her physician, abortion. Therefore, abortion access is encompassed by the right to privacy and also because of the 14th Amendment's concept of liberty. So, the question is, is abortion really a private matter? No. No, it is not. Because in order to consider abortion a private matter, you not only have to completely ignore the nature of the procedure, but also the outside interests that are affected by the abortion. If we agree that a private matter would be if individual interests in which government and uninvolved third parties can can claim no valid or permissible interest, it follows that before the abortion decision may be characterized as a private matter or not, between a woman and her physician, the non-maternal interests involved in such a decision must be identified and then weighed so as to confirm they have no valid or permissible interest. The primary non-maternal interest, of course, would be the life of the unborn. That's the whole shtick. Since the unborn are not capable of serving or protecting their own interests, those interests must be protected and asserted by government or by concerned third parties. That would be the pro-life movement. Approaching the problem from the perspective of those who perceive abortion as the taking of a human life, rejection of the privacy argument follows logically from the commonly held belief that the taking of a human life is a proper matter of societal concern. Given the interest being asserted by the opponents of legal abortion, which is the right of the unborn child to life, making a pro-abortion argument that's based upon the right to privacy is no argument at all. That is not an argument. That's a conclusion based upon a decision that maternal interests take precedence over the lives of the unborn. And as we'll go over, the vast majority of abortions aren't about the mother's health or about rape. They're about lifestyle convenience. Abortion is not a private matter. Sure. Maybe the personal decision, maybe that's a private matter, but when does it stop being private? At what arbitrary point would the line be drawn? Is it still private when the state licensed practitioner performs the procedure in a regulated health facility? And remember, the legal precedent that established this right to privacy was within the context of, hey, people should have the privacy in their bedrooms to choose whether or not to take birth control. And now it turns out that that privacy also encompasses an, 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 an operating theater in a hospital in which a child is murdered. Like, are you just joking? Am I being punked? Where's Ash? Is Ashton here? This misinterpretation of the Bill on Rights and the 14th Amendment, but also significant case law, too. That's probably the most intelligent of the pro-abortion arguments, but um, only because it's affirmed legally, for now, at least. Uh, these other ones won't take as long to get through. Okay, so women, women have a right to control their own bodies. We shouldn't be forced to have kids. Correct. We agree. No one's forcing you to have kids. 
No one's advocating for pregnancy quotas. Something has to happen to you before you become pregnant. Something that typically only happened when a mommy and a daddy loved each other very much and then, you know, we go from there. So reproduction does not occur at the hospital. Reproduction by definition takes place at conception. What you deliver at the hospital has already been produced. What we're concerned about is not your body. We are actually concerned about the life that is growing inside of your body, which is overwhelmingly a result of choices that you made. Sometimes it was because of rape. Yes, and we will go over that. But over 99% of the time, a baby is facing a, being aborted. That baby was created consensually. The baby is a result of your own actions. Would you like to know what the odds are of becoming pregnant if you don't have sex? Zero. Won't happen. But you're like, well, I want to do that thing that was designed to create life, but here's the catch. I don't actually want to create the life. Well, then act like it. 46% of women getting abortions did not use any form of birth control in the month that they had conceived the child. And among those that did use birth control, a significant proportion was using it inconsistently. So now, because you were irresponsible, you wanted to have sex without consequence, and then you didn't even take the necessary precautions to avoid that consequence. Now a child has to die because of your irresponsibility, is what you're saying. Oh, well, maybe, maybe if women had access to birth control, they could, condoms are 50 cents. Shut up. You could be simultaneously using three forms of birth control and still get pregnant. That's the risk you have to bear in mind. This should not surprise you. Why is it they always have to, they have to follow up by forwarding the blame? Oh, but if, or if, if only like just be responsible. If you were responsible, there would be no need for abortion in the first place. The idea that you have a right to choose is not only incorrect as we just went over, but it assumes that you have a right to what you're choosing over the life of the child. That child has a right to life as we all do. It's in the constitution. You don't get to end that life at your convenience because of something that you're convinced is hiding somewhere between the lines of the constitution. And, uh, and sure, the precedent for now is on your side that the child isn't protected under the 14th Amendment, and that's why they have to maintain the euphemisms. That's why they have to repeat the focus group talking points. It's a clump of cells. It's the termination of a pregnancy because there's no way to make a coherent and moral argument on behalf of killing your child for your convenience. Things like, oh, I'm done having children. I'm a student, I don't feel mature enough, which makes up 85% of abortion cases. These figures even coming from a pro-abortion institute. Okay, next one. The, the baby's not viable. The baby is not viable, therefore it's not alive. It has no rights. Okay, sure, what do you mean by viable? That the baby's not able to survive independently? Sure. Uh, what about babies that have been delivered now they're in the care of their parents? They aren't viable. If you leave it alone, it will die. Is that death justified should the parents not be prosecuted for negligence? What about your elderly relatives? My grandma lived to be 96. She definitely was not viable for her last few years. To her merit, she tried to be, but there was no way that she would have survived without the care or supervision that she received. Does that forfeit the validity of her life because she wasn't viable? What you'll find is that regardless of which arbitrary metric you choose to adjudicate viability, there is a parallel circumstance for other human lives that you would not agree have no right to life. The youngest surviving premature baby was born at 21 weeks. His name is James Gill, and had he been killed by his parents the day after his birthday, his parents would be rightfully prosecuted. But babies can be killed in the womb at that same age and no one bats an eye because it's all according to plan. He's obviously the extreme example. Even infants born at 26 weeks have a 90% chance of survival and those born at 23 weeks have between a 20 and 35% chance. Well, infants born at eight weeks can't survive, therefore they're not viable. Again, ability to independently survive equating to viability would invalidate the right to life that toddlers have, that people on life support have, all sorts of people that you wouldn't try to make a case against regarding their right to live. It gets even more disturbing when they start talking about cognitive development. I don't even know if I want to get into that because it basically, uh, it's basically eugenics against people with mental impairments if the logic is consistently applied. What's the difference between a plant uh, the day before or after it spreads? It. It's still the same living thing, just in a different stage of development. There's no way to consistently apply this logic without dictating that certain people don't get to live as a result. Okay, the baby is incapable of feeling pain. I don't see how this is even relevant. It's not true, but no one is saying babies have a right to either live or die pain-free. No, we are consistently just for the live part. So we can give it anesthesia so it doesn't feel pain. Thank you. Okay, never mind. Now I feel now I feel okay about it dying. But regardless, the general figure would be that the baby can feel pain at 20 weeks. That being said, it can potentially feel pain earlier, but it varies based on individual developments. Sensory receptors around the mouth of the child develop at about seven weeks, and then by 20 weeks, they're present all over the body of the child. Babies have even been shown to respond negatively to invasive procedures as early as eight weeks, when its heart is now beating as well, by the way. 
Next one, restricting abortion access costs lives. Ironically ignoring that enabling abortion access costs lives by definition. But what they're saying is that women will now seek out illegal abortions and will be more likely to die as a result. This is not true. Abortion rates increased dramatically after Roe v. Wade and also abortion as a procedure is inherently somewhat dangerous. The year before Roe, 39 women died from illegal abortions and 24 women died from legal abortions. And they'll say, oh, conservatives think that abortion bans will work, but gun bans won't? Idiots. And it's like, no, straw man. You guys unironically think abortion bans won't work, but gun bans will. The argument isn't whether or not the gun ban will work. The argument is whether or not you can even do it. I don't care if the gun ban will work. It just so happens the evidence is on my side. But even if it wasn't, you could not convince me to disarm myself. Even if you showed me a study that said, hey, John Doyle, every life ever can be saved if you hand over your guns, signed Jesus, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't abdicate my right to self-preservation so I can cross my fingers and just hope the government will do it for me. Maybe, maybe for Jesus in writing. I don't know. So again... The core of the gun argument isn't whether or not it'll work. It's whether or not you can do it, which you can't. That's why if you tried it, people would resist and probably incite Civil War II, the sequel. And you know that. And that's why you don't try it. Do you really think people would be out there shooting people trying to take their guns? Like, you simply misunderstand the data. Australia's buyback was not statistically significant. Like, no, it's about the principle. It's a right to bear arms. It's explicitly stated in the Constitution, unlike your BS right to an abortion. It's the same principle, which is just because you make certain choices, that does not mean the rights of others can be infringed upon. Someone shoots up a theater, that was their choice. Taking my right to bear arms away is not going to change that. I should not be punished for a crime that I did not commit, just as an infant in the womb should not be killed because his or her parents were acting irresponsibly. What was, oh yeah, costing lives thing, right. So you have to consider the degrees to which people will go for their lifestyle to not be inconvenienced. We know that 85% of abortion cases are for lifestyle conveniences. We know that if a mother's health is at risk, it's exceptions can be made. Uh, so you gotta ask yourself, do you really think that a woman who finds out that she's pregnant and doesn't want to be pregnant because she feels that she's too young to raise a child right now, do you really think that given that there's no state licensed, licensed abortion dudes anymore, that the black market would be very expensive because the consequences of the person performing the procedure is caught? Um, do you think it'll be better for the mother to have the kid than to take those risks. Maybe 1% of the mothers are desperate enough to take those risks, but I don't believe that those risks would be taken to preserve lifestyle convenience. Also, here's a really important part. People know right now in their minds that if all else fails, they could just have an abortion. They have that safety net in the back of their minds. Is it crazy to assume that when the safety net disappears, they might make better decisions to avoid becoming pregnant in the first place, now bearing in mind that they can't abort the child? 46% were not using birth control. A lot of those that were using birth control were misusing it. And now for the really dark one. This is the one you've been waiting for. Please come at me for this one. I could not care less. I don't care about someone risking their life in the process of ending another human life. Could not care less. Your right to life ends when you infringe upon the life of another person. If you break into my house armed, you are no longer, I mean, you don't have a right to life. You better hope that my tech nine jams, which it probably will, which is why I wouldn't have even grabbed it in the first place, you fool. I will outfox you every time. But the life, the life of the child the existence of that child, if it's inconvenient to you, obviously I don't wish harm upon you. I don't want anything bad to happen. But if you are so determined to selfishly end that child's life that you pursue an unregulated and potentially unsafe abortion procedure, just like with sex, you knew the consequences going into it. I would hope that everything turns out okay for you. But at some point, you gotta accept responsibility for the consequences of your actions. You can always put the child up for adoption. Oh, typically this triggers the, uh, but no child should be born unwanted. The child won't be wanted, therefore we can kill it. Why do you get to decide what quality of life that child is entitled to? Why is it that you get to say, well, I wouldn't be happy if I were put up for adoption or if I was born into a poor family, so I'm gonna actually do the child a favor by killing it. That's the really dark part. They've convinced themselves that they're doing it out of altruism. Why do you, why do you get to decide the risk aversion of that child? And why are their children born in these circumstances in the first place? Did these mothers know better than you or did they not do the same analysis that you did? Did you stay up later doing the math? Why should anyone really be alive? Why should homeless people be alive? Are they having fun? Every day we make a choice to be alive. Like literally by waking up every morning and not immediately killing yourself, you are choosing to be alive. You are accepting the inevitable tragedy, tragedy of life and saying, yep, I'm gonna get through this. Life is hard. Let the child live and decide that for themselves. Don't selfishly and grossly overestimate your judgment in the name of killing your child. Next one, abortion reduces crime. This is from that Freakonomics guy. What's his face? 
Levitt, Stephen Levitt, they published a study in 2001 claiming that since Roe v. Wade in 1973, crime had decreased significantly. It's, be, it's because the would-be criminals have been aborted. This has actually been statistically refuted many times, but they're correct when they say that the crime dropped, but it's not because of, um, because of abortion. And we know that young men between 17 and 25 commit the majority of crimes right when their, their aggression and immaturity are peaking. And so if abortion had been the cause of the crime decrease, we would have seen the crime rates in that age group decrease first, but that wasn't the case. The crime rates decreased in the older demographics, nearly 60% of the decline of murder since 1990 involved killers that were older than 25, therefore making them born before Roe v. Wade and immune to abortion as a result. No one was talking about post-birth abortion back then. But even on the surface, it's the same thing. They're saying, hey, the algorithm says that if this child is born, it'll probably be a criminal. So let's kill it. Don't let it live and figure it out for itself. No, just kill it. Decide for the child. Ignore the child's right to choose. It's right to choose whether or not it starts carjacking people. I mean, practically everyone, everyone cool came from a broken home. Let him be the next Tim Allen or something, you know? No matter how bad a home environment there is no 100% guarantee that the child will become a criminal. And because of that, you can't say their life is invalid. Uh, we need abortion because population control. This is typical alarmist rhetoric. Oh, there's overpopulation. People will starve to death. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't true in 1968 when that Stanford professor published that book, The Population Bomb, predicting worldwide famine and starvation. Of course, none of that happened. Poverty is decreasing. We're going to eradicate extreme poverty by 2030. Interesting how more people hasn't caused starvation and famine. People are living longer, more prosperous, and healthy lives than previous generations ever could have imagined. The UN, they're pretty dumb. They're freaking out about uh, 11 billion by 2100. Other studies say in roughly 9 billion before 2060 and then our population is actually going to start to shrink. But again, you buying into overpopulation alarmism doesn't mean you get to kill other people. The only life that you get to control is your own. So hey, if you know something I don't about starvation and overpopulation, the only way to solve it is to immediately reduce the population. I don't know, man. Take one for the team, maybe increase my average caloric intake by 0.00004% since food is finite, I guess. I'm kidding kidding. It's a joke. Relax. Hey, don't get mad at me for making suicide jokes. I'm the one that's arguing that life is precious here. Okay, come on. Abortion in cases of rape or incest. Yeah, this one's actually pretty simple. No. Do you think we haven't thought this through when we say we're concerned about the child, the life of the child in the womb? And you say, well, what if, what if she was raped? What if it's incest? Do you think we're going to be like, wait a second. We did not think this through. Okay, you know what? Never mind. No, in order for that to have any effect on the principle of us caring about that life, it would have to mean that because of the way that the child was conceived, its life is inherently less valuable. I know people that were conceived in rape. Do you believe that their life is inherently less valuable? I know that they certainly don't. It's awful. Absolutely. Yes, we agree. Should we publicly castrate the rapist? Assuming there's evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. Yes, of course. We agree. Rape is bad. We should also be able to agree that murder is bad. And by the way, the fact that abortion and rape are brought up so much is intellectually dishonest. If you truly believed that abortion were okay, there would be no need to twist the morality by citing extreme cases that occur less than 2% of the time. If abortion were okay, you would say, well, what if I don't feel mature enough? What if it's inconvenient to my lifestyle? Again, 85% of the time. But you don't because you know that that's selfish. So you say, well, what if I was raped? Because then that puts the pro-lifer in a tough position because obviously that's a lot harder of a position to be in than keeping the child despite you not feeling mature enough. But hey, pro-lifer, hey buddy, did you lose your balls? Don't let them bully you into cowering because of statistical anomalies. All life is valid regardless of the circumstances of conception, period. That's the idea. If you're uncomfortable with that, perhaps reconsider your morality. We can't make exceptions for rape and incest. To do that would suggest that that life is less valuable, which it isn't. And then that would also collapse the whole point of our movement. Also, how do we prove it was actually rape? Do we just take them at their word or do we have to go through an investigation? Abortion is endorsed by some religious organizations, therefore it's okay. I don't care. I don't care. This isn't an actual argument. It's trying to be, but it, it's an argument from authority. They're saying, well, this religious group supports it, therefore it's okay. Like, all right, what if I don't care what the religious group thinks, which is likely a side effect of me not being a member of said group? Then the argument means nothing to me. Would you look at that? The argument means nothing to me. It's the equivalent of saying, Alyssa Milano thinks abortion is okay, therefore you should too. It's like, no, I don't care what she thinks. Your opinion should be derivative from your own beliefs, not the beliefs of other people. Conservatives are pro-life, but yet they support the death penalty, LMAO. Yeah, isn't it funny how the cons want to kill convicted murderers, but not innocent children? That's very quirky of you to point that out to us. Thank you. How zany of you. 
When you infringe upon the liberty of others, you forfeit your right to liberty. This is called prison. That's what the whole social contract is. You don't infringe upon the rights of others, and then in exchange, the governments will, in theory, enforce your rights. Well, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. What are you, a cyclops? You have a whole other eye. Men are controlling women's bodies. Again, no. No one cares about your body. We're only caring about the child that's growing inside of it. Also, which men are you referring to? Half of women are pro-life and about half of men are pro-life too. So what you're really upset about is that half of all men and women are trying to keep the other half of women from killing their children. And then that other half of men, they're just along for the ride because they think it'll make the feminists want to sleep with them or because they like abortion because it enables them to use women without consequence. This whole idea of there being a male consensus against abortion, against this female consensus for abortion, is just so false. It's actually laughable. Go to a pro-life rally. It's all women. Women there defending that beautiful and magical thing that only women can do, create life. And they're there defending the importance of that. Here's a fun one. Men that are against abortion are sexually incompetent. This one isn't really an argument, but if you follow me on Twitter, you know that someone threw this at me the other night after I tweeted an optimistic prediction about my generation being alive to see Roe be overturned. And this woman replies by saying, that's a lot to say I've never made a woman have an orgasm, to which I replied, I hate to dignify this with a response, but one, half of women are pro-life, so framing this as if women are in consensus against men is incorrect, about half of men are pro-life as well, and two, assuming conservative men are incapable of or unwilling to satisfy their partner is not only a comically unintelligent interpretation of the argument, but also a bold door to open from the party whose men want abortion access so that they can use women without consequence. Basically what I just said, but yeah, they think that men are just trying to ruin everything for women, and because of that, they don't want to allow women to have abortions, and P.S., they're also sexually incompetent. Like, okay, good one. Good burn. I'll send you a copy of John Doyle, an owner's guide. What I really wanted to do, I almost did this. Some men that typically have a lot of resentment towards women argue that the female orgasm just doesn't exist in the first place. And I really wanted to send her a link to that Reddit form and just be like, here, read up, woman. But of course, I did not. I, I took the high ground. You're taking us back to the 1940s. This one is really funny because you can really see the arrogance beneath it. They're saying that because we're going against leftist policies, policies that are labeled progressive, that we are backtracking as a country. And this is arrogant and stupid, frankly, because it assumes that all of their ideas are inherently a net gain, that every single one of their ideas improves and progresses society. And if we do anything that goes against their ideas, what are you do? You're taking us back in time. Like evaluate the idea as is. Don't attach a date to it to make your argument. Hey, let's start dividing people into girls and boys. What are you, you're taking us back to 2015. Adoption isn't an option because kids in foster care have it rough. Why do you get to decide that for them? Too hard, you should just die. Putting your child up for adoption is free. You can even receive living expenses from the adoptive family like rent, food, clothes, utility, even a cell phone. Like it's so possible. It's almost laughably possible, just how possible it is. Oh, but my right to privacy. Adoption can be confidential. Your friends, family, community, they don't have to know a thing. There's always a solution. If you don't want them to see you pregnant, you can arrange to move away for a while and receive aid. There are very filled waiting lists of couples that want your baby. If you don't want your baby, they do. Don't kill it just because you don't want it. I mean, there are even waiting lists for children with special needs. And that's not to say children with special needs are less valuable. It's just that there are obviously going to be less couples with the experience and ability to take care of that child. So... If a guy can get a woman pregnant and run away, why is it the woman's responsibility? I agree. Yeah. Yeah, we can reach an agreement there. We'll ban abortions and then we'll enforce the participation of the father, like how we already often do. That's reprehensible and men that do that are pathetic excuses for men. You don't do that under any circumstances. Not to your wife, not to your kids. So yeah, I agree with this. But the solution is not to enable men to do this by allowing for abortion. The solution is to hold both the mother and the father accountable. Pro-life movement forces their morality onto others. We we don't. We just leave it up to the woman to decide. First of all, there's no morality in the pro-choice movement. That's why they call it pro-choice and not pro-abortion. They have to frame it as if the other side is somehow oppressing women by restricting this fabled choice that they have as to whether or not to murder their child. If you don't agree that human life has value, you are out of touch with what we've established as objective morality. If you don't believe in objective morality, then of course this makes sense to you. If you reject the pro-life position that all life has value, then you are by definition immoral because you don't conform to objective morality. And to this you'll say, well, John, you're trying to say that anyone who isn't pro-life is immoral. Not necessarily. Pro-abortion people are either ignorant or immoral. I find that it's typically the former. They agree that human life has value, but they've bought into this propagandized mainstream narrative that excludes life in the womb from that definition of life. 
Banning abortions won't stop abortions. Yes, it will, to a large extent. We've gone over that. It will rewire the culture into taking more responsibility than they previously would have. Also, that's not even an argument against banning abortions. Don't make goring people with axes illegal because people will still gore each other with axes. That's not the point. The point is that the law should reflect morality. And just because women want access to abortion does not mean that it's a morally correct policy. If men could get pregnant, abortion would be a sacrament. Again, this, this is the same false male versus female narrative. It's also transphobic, by the way. Men can get pregnant too, bigot. But assuming the pre-2016 standards of reproduction, only women can get pregnant, yet half of them are against abortion. So your logic of this gender can't get pregnant, therefore they don't support it. Well, this gender can get pregnant, and half of them don't support it. And men can't get pregnant, but still about half of them don't support it. Babies are parasites to the mother. What a special thing to say. Wow. Aside from the obvious problems, it doesn't work on a literal level either. The biological definition of parasitism is a form of symbiosis in which one organism, called a parasite, benefits at the expense of another organism, usually of a different species, called a host. First, parasites are a different species, usually, than the host, and uh, they unnaturally latch onto it to survive. Babies are the same species as their mother, and they're right there where they're supposed to be, in the womb, almost as if there was some sort of design behind this. If there was, it was pretty intelligent. It's a pretty intelligent design. Anyways, the changes that take place in a woman's body during pregnancy naturally occur to accommodate the child. Sure, challenges can surface during pregnancy, but they are in no way comparable to the damage an actual parasite does. There are actually a lot of health benefits that arise during pregnancy. Um, it would be better described as mutualism, I think. But why do they do this? Why, why is this their running gag? Why do they hate biology? Why is, why is this a motif for them? Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the socialist darling from New York, says that abortion is about trying to outlaw sex. No, it's about protecting the baby. But this really showcases their, their thought process quite well. They don't seem to accept the connection between sex and childbearing. If you're against abortion because you think it will outlaw sex, that must mean that you are talking about the type of sex that would require abortion, which is sex that is free of commitment, free of love, free of trust. They want to continue to embrace this sexual degeneracy and hedonism without having to accept responsibility for their actions. That's what it comes down to. This one's funny. Uh, they think that when men masturbate, it's the equivalent of abortion. And this is because they don't understand the difference between a sperm and an embryo. And you know how I know, you know how I know that those are different? One of them requires the other in order to exist. The embryo cannot be created without the sperm from the father. So in order for this to make sense, they must believe that women create the embryo, the child, by themselves, because if they think that women getting abortions is equal to men masturbating, then they must think that the woman is just disposing of something that was already inside of her. They fail to acknowledge the act that was necessary to create that child, ideally between a man and a woman in a committed relationship. Masturbation doesn't kill anything because nothing was alive for it to kill in the first place. If the sperm is left alone, literally nothing will happen. If the embryo is left alone, it will become a full-grown baby. That's the difference. If you can't see that, like, I, I will pray for you. Blowjobs are cannibalism. Same thing. You have to be really stupid to actually make arguments like this. Maybe we should. Maybe we should try and restrict their reproduction. I kid, I kid. They're pro-life until a child is born, then they don't care. They're not pro-life, they're pro-birth. Your right to life does not include your right to be provided for by someone else. Obviously, your parents should provide for you, but the point is that just because a third party doesn't want something bad to happen to you does not mean that they have to assume responsibility for you. This is the equivalent of someone getting kicked off a bus and then you thinking, wow, that wasn't nice. And then someone saying, unless you want to drive him, you don't even talk. It's not grounded in reality. No uterus, no opinion. Again, that's transphobic. I don't need a uterus to talk about abortion. We have this thing called free speech. It's in our, printed in our constitution, unlike your right to an abortion, but this is a classic example of identity politics. This idea that if I send a text to one of my friends with my opinion on abortion and she reads it aloud, it's somehow more valid just because she has a uterus. That's sexist by definition. I don't have to play basketball to talk about basketball. I don't even have to know anything about basketball to talk about basketball. And this one isn't even consistent because they're also screaming that, men, you gotta speak up and, and use your privilege to help women. So it's not that we can't have an opinion. It's that we can't have a different opinion. Oh, and then, and then they'll say, look at these men deciding laws for women. And it's like, yeah, a group of men decided Roe v. Wade. So be consistent. Men are technically the ones that established your right to abortion. How is it that we ban abortion before we ban guns? Well, we haven't banned it yet, but it's probably got something to do with what's actually explicitly printed in our constitution. But hey, you should be happy because abortion kills way more people than guns do every year. My uterus, my choice, correct. It's your uterus, your choice to have a child. Once you make that decision and a child is coming, you don't get to kill it. 
If you weren't ready to have a child, maybe you should not have been doing that thing that creates children in the first place, especially while not even taking reliable or consistent birth control as we've gone over. Again, this has nothing to do with you or your body or controlling you. Sorry, you're not that special. It's not about you, it's about your child. That's it, once it's alive and well, no one will ever bother you about any of this again. Teenagers shouldn't be involved in politics, and religion shouldn't be involved in government, and men should not be involved in women's health care. But here we are. Wow. How brave. The reason teenagers shouldn't be involved in politics is because we're stupid. I mean, obviously we should be able to comment about it, but voting at 16 is stupid. If anything, the voting age should be raised. But anyways, even if these were true, it's complete whataboutism. It's the, the two quoque fallacy, two quoque, however it's pronounced. Abortion isn't being banned because of religion. It's being banned on a secularly moral basis. So you're saying that because A and B agree on C, they're the same, which is another logical fallacy. And also that men shouldn't be involved in women's health care. Abortion isn't health care. And again, we've gone over the identity politics. This is so boring. I'm so bored of these people. Have a new thought. Like, stop being so stupid. Transcend your group identity. Stop getting manipulated by your friends. Go piss someone off for once. I don't care what your profession is, what your political beliefs are, whatever it is you do in life. If you haven't made some people mad along the way, uh, chances are you've sacrificed your principles for adulation. Or maybe you're just a pawn, maybe a bit of both. A state that criminalizes abortion but ranks 50th in public education doesn't care about kids. Okay, well, to be fair, someone had to be last because that's how rankings work. Our public education is pretty subpar, especially for developed countries. Maybe we should have more private schools. Who knows? But I'll tell you what. A state that has excellent public education but allows for its kids to be murdered cares less than a state that has terrible public education but does not allow for its kids to be murdered. This whole idea that living takes precedence over the non-living. I mean, sure, if we're talking about voting on who gets to eat the last coconut and half of our island tribe is dead, I could buy into that. But the child is living. You cannot honestly reject that truth. The reason that it's such a controversial issue, the reason that mothers grieve after they get abortions, is because people recognize that what is growing inside of you is a separate human being that is alive and genetically different than you. You have an instinct as a mother to protect that life. When you work against that instinct, when you do something that you know is wrong, you experience guilt. People bring up abortion but mock vegans. What, what does that even mean? Are they, do they think a baby in the womb is less valuable than a chicken? I think they're trying to say that like life, like all life is equal. To that I disagree. I'm team human, baby. Team human every day till I die, like quite literally speaking. Oh, this isn't, this one's not even about abortion, but this is like alarmingly unintelligent. This girl posted this. I had to include it. She puts up a black and white picture of white people just having fun, minding their own business. And she's like, um, can we take a look and not forget that this was during segregation? Thanks. And she's all virtuous. She's, she's an altruist. And then someone comments, hey, isn't that a picture from a Taylor Swift music video? She's like, haha, I didn't even notice. Dude, come on. Be more careful with your white guilt and virtue signaling next time. Like, I, f I feel compelled to apologize on your behalf because of how cringe-inducing that was. Almost done. School shootings happen. United States, let's force an 11-year-old girl to give birth. This is a very small-minded way of thinking because it treats the United States as if it's one solid entity that acts and responds to things. And of course, that's not true. We have people working trying to make schools safer. At the same time, other people are working to make sure that kids get a chance to go to school in the first place by, you know, not being murdered by their parents. The fact that you're upset about school shootings proves that you recognize the value of human life. So it's just that you're too ignorant to recognize the validity of the stage of life that you used to be in, that we all used to be in. So last one. This one's not as stupid as the last few. It's still stupid, but the guy thinks he's being really smart. This went somewhat viral on Twitter a few years ago. This guy, Patrick Tomlinson, tweeted this. And it's so cringe to see how he sets it up. Like, he makes himself sound like this intellectual demigod. He goes, whenever abortion comes up, I have a question. I've been asking for 10 years now. The life begins at conception crowd. In 10 years, no one's ever been able to answer it honestly. Yikes. He continues, it's a simple scenario with two outcomes. No one ever wants to pick one because the correct answer destroys their argument with facts and logic. And there is a correct answer, which is why the pro-life crowd hates it. Here it is. You're in a fertility clinic. Why isn't uh, is important? Your alarm goes off. Run for the exit. As you run down the hallway, you hear a child screaming from behind a door. You throw open the door and find a five-year-old child crying for help. There in one corner of the room, the other corner of the room, you spot a frozen container labeled a thousand viable human embryos. The smoke is rising. You start to choke. You know you can grab one or the other, but not both before you succumb to smoke inhalation and die. Saving one. Do you, do you save A? Do you save B? thousand embryos. There's no C. C means you all die. In a decade of arguing with anti-abortion people about the definition of human life, I have never gotten a single straight answer. A or B, blah, blah, blah. I never will. They will never answer honestly because we all instinctively understand the correct answer is A. A human child is worth more than a thousand embryos or 10,000 or a million. 
because they're not the same, not morally, not ethically, not biologically. This question absolutely eviscerates their arguments with facts and logic, and their refusal to answer confirms that they know it to be true. No one anywhere actually believes an embryo is equivalent to a child. That person does not exist. They are lying to you. They are lying to you to try and evoke an emotional reaction, uh, a response that's projecting a little bit, a paternal response using false equivalency. No one believes life begins at conception. No one believes embryos are babies or children. Those who claim are trying to manipulate, manip, manip, manipulate you. They can control women. Don't believe it, you know, reveal them for who they are. Dox them, demand they answer your question. And then they don't slap a big old scarlet P off patriarchy on them. Again, yikes, I mean, this guy is a total douche. His whole tactic here is claiming that everyone he's ever told this to has lied to him and everyone always will. It's like, if we ignore that, if we ignore the fact this douchebag has to paint a very vivid and specific hypothetical and then preface it by saying, no one has ever been able to answer. In order to make his point with this extreme hypothetical scenario, ignoring that, his thinking is flawed. Because he's assuming that the value of life is a zero-sum game. Either it has value and you can't kill it, or it doesn't have value and you can kill it. If I were in a burning building with my mom and your mom, I'm saving my mom. If I were in a building with my mom and both of your parents, I'm saving my mom. That doesn't mean that your parents' lives aren't valuable. All human life has intrinsic value, but guess what? If we do away with the hypotheticals, you take away the smoke and mirrors, how about this one? I put a human embryo on the ground in front of you. Do you step on it? This isolates the variables. No zero sum, either A, you agree its life is valuable, you don't step on it, or B, you don't agree its life is valuable and you step on it. Riddle me that one, Patrick, or how about we do away with all the hypotheticals? I'm done with, I have a headache now if we're gonna be entirely candid. Leave a comment with any arguments that I missed. None of these arguments were actually good. I'm bored of the euphemisms. I am bored of the appeals to emotion. I am bored of, oh, well, what if you're in a building and it's on fire and then your grandpa's there but he forgot his EpiPen in the car? I don't care. I don't care. What if you stop being a p Confront the argument. Look me in the eye. Tell me that 85% of abortions are for lifestyle convenience and you are okay with that death. Be honest with yourself, you miserable slugs. That's the despicable part. You know it's wrong. That's why you do this. If you didn't think it were wrong, you'd be honest. But you know it's wrong, so you lie. You are the lowest of the low. Your ancestors are frowning upon you. I treasure the time that I don't have to spend watching you indoctrinate people into not only undermining the value of human life, but actually advocating for its destruction. I would like to see you console a mother that miscarried at 12 weeks by saying, hey, it's okay. It wasn't a life anyways, right? Hey guys, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and leave it a comment with your thoughts. You can also subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And uh, yeah, life is precious. We gotta stop killing babies. I mean, uh, what's that one Professor Hulk quote? I see this as an absolute win. That's how I'm feeling about the pro-life cause. I truly think that my generation will see Roe get overturned. So thank you so much for watching and may God bless America.